I would like to thank you all for accepting our invitation to attend this virtual meeting. شرفني طبعا اقدم البروفيسور دكتور ماجي عبد الوهاب بروفيسور اوف بيدياتريك هيماتولوجي كايرو يونيفرستي بيدياتريك هوستل ان شاء الله احنا النهارده البرزنتيشن هيكون مدته نص ساعه في نهايه البرزنتيشن هيكون في فقره الكيو اند اي اي سؤال يو كان شير يور كويستشن في الشات الشات بارت وان شاء الله دكتور ماجي يعني تتفضل بالرد على حضراتكم على كل الاسئله بتاعتكم وانا هستاذن حضراتكم اي ويل ميوت اول حفظاً بس على وصول البرزنتيشن لحضراتكم without any sort of distraction. Thank you so much. Thank you so much لحضراتكم ويسعدني جداً وشرفني أنا مع حضراتكم. دكتور ماجي حضرتك تقدري تبدأي دلوقتي. مايك مع حضراتك. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. the clinical presentation of children with hemophilia. So, and being an excellent recessive, definitely, as you know, it, it will usually present in a male, but can present in very few cases in a female. So, early on, on in life, patients will present with both circumcision bleeding or post sampling, or, and when he starts to be mobile, then he will have bruising as well as hematomas. Afterwards, he will start to have teeth eruption, and he, he can blaze on having teeth eruption, and he can have cysts. Now, we all know that heme arthrosis is the hallmark of severe hemophilia, whether uh, trauma, uh, whether post-traumatic or spontaneous, <coughs> and it would most commonly involve the knee joint, but it can involve other joints, as the elbows, ankles, or shoulders. And it's very important here to note the bone changes that are usually associated with the heme arthrosis. Now, regarding Bonville Brand disease, now Bonville Brand disease is a totally different disease. Though it's deficient uh, due to a Bonville Brand factor, which represents part of factor eight, yet usually the presentation is of a mucocutaneous bleed. And as you, as you can see here, uh, uh, this is a very brief resume of the signs and symptoms of Bonville Brand disease. And if, uh, if this is a type three, then it can resemble hemophilia, uh, especially with the heme arthrosis. Now, so the patient can have subcutaneous bleeds in the form of petechiae, as you can see here, or hematomas, oral or epistaxis bleeding, or, or, or epistaxis or nose bleeds, or GI bleeds in the form of bleeding for rectum, hematemesis, melina, or hematuria. Now, it's very important, and that's why I put it in the center, and I focused on it, that females with bundle brand disease will present with menorrhagia. And here, actually, I put the menorrhagia and the hemothrosis together because this is usually what you get in type 3, which is uh, quite prevalent in our societies because of consanguineous marriages. It's important to note that there is considerable heterogeneity with large inter- and intrafamilial variability. Now, regarding, as we, uh, as we saw before here, the presentation of bungle gland disease, I would really like to highlight that the clinical expression is usually mild in most patients with bungle gland disease type 1, whereas severity is typically greater. If you remember, there was the table in the prevalence where we put the types, the bungle gland disease type 1, 2, and 3. So, the, uh, the severity is typically greater, of course, in the... Uh, type 2 uh, bundle brand disease with all its subtypes and particularly bundle brand disease type 3. The severity generally, but not always, correlates with the degree of reduction of bundle brand factor and factor 8. Now regarding diagnosis, hemophilia of course is diagnosed by a prolonged partial thromboplastin time. A partial thromboplastin time and a specific factor essay. We have three main criteria that are required for the diagnosis of bumble brand disease. That would be a positive bleeding history since childhood, reduced bumble brand factor activity in plasma, and history of bleeding in the family. 
Now, regarding pediatric patients, it's very important to pause here and note that they may not have experienced significant hemostatic challenges. And hemostatic challenges usually are the dental extractions or the tonsillectomies. So, um, we, so th therefore, they would have fewer bleeding complaints than adults with similar bumble brand factor levels. However, despite these limitations, the lab test for bumble brand disease remains a crucial part of the coagulation work of patients with bleeding symptoms. Now, especially in bumble brand disease, we usually come across this dilemma. So, a lab diagnosis made on the basis of a personal history of few symptoms, specifically menorrhagia, or no symptoms at all, would we screen patients? So, can we do asymptomatic screening or uh, do something else? So, what can we resort to? Now, menorrhagia is found in 29 to 44% of otherwise healthy um, women, compared to 50 to 60% of vulnerable brand disease females. So, is screening advisable for vulnerable brand disease for all patients referred to with menorrhagia? Now, the answer is, according to a recent multi-center multi -center survey, it's been demonstrated that the pre that the pretest probability likelihood ratio of vulnerable brand clinically relevant history of a bleeding is present, at least if we have two hemorrhagic symptoms in the proband or a bleeding score of more than three using the ISTH BAT, which is the standard bleeding uh, tool, or more uh, equal or more than five in females. Now, regarding the lab diagnosis of bone brand disease, initially the initial screening would be by a, a particle pump of lost in time. Sometimes the bleeding time, so we can pick up the platelet type that's not common in our cohort, as well as a CBC and a uh, factor eight activity. It's very important to note that. Uh, bumper brand uh, disease diagnosis relies on both the bumper brand function as well as the clinical history. And very importantly, the level of bumper brand activities are always below the normal range observed in healthy individuals. However, regarding the recoff, it varies from very low to the mild uh, efficiency. This is the laboratory work up for the types in case you're interested, but I want to go into that. Regarding the clinical manifestations and classification, we already mentioned that it, there is um, a, a, a wide phenotypic variability ranging from mild up to severe. So, treatments. Very important here to pause that treatment of inherited bleeding disorders in general, hemophilia and bone brand disease in particular, is a multidisciplinary. So it's a comprehensive care team care. Now the treatment would incl include on demand, and that would be treating the patient during his bleed or a prophylaxis. Now in both cases, that would include replacement therapy, adjunctive therapy, and packed IBCs transfusion. Now we will know when we will do each of these in the next slides. It's not only the treatment of the disease, but also the complications of the disease as well as the complications of the treatment. And arthropathy and intracranial hemorrhage are the um, significant more, uh, uh, causes of morbidity and mortality in those patients, especially hemophilics, as well as inhibitors or inhibitor detection. Now, gynecologically, I point you to that because this is a very important issue in patients with bumble brand disease. Actually, the availability of factor eight products has resulted in decreased mortality from bleeding, but recurrent bleeding into joints and muscles continue to be seen. And joint arthropathy, muscle damage, disability are the most frequent sequelae of the condition. So this led us to the standard of care of person with hemophilia, and that is prophylaxis. And as you, if you remember the picture before, uh, um, in, um, in the slide of the uh, prevalence where you had on the right hand corner a patient that are in the developing country and on the left hand corner a patient from a developed country. So it's usually a self infusion of factor eight to three times a week. And that is a paradigm shift in the management of severe hemophilia. Now, so just a glimpse of how therapy evolved in hemophilia. So it just started all with whole blood, then it was the fresh frozen plasma and anti hemophilic factor, then cryoprecipitate, then the plasma derived 
And afterwards, we had the recomponent. And the recomponent factor eight replacement in the 1990s was actually the first leap or jump in the treatment of, of persons with hemophilia. Afterwards came the long acting or the expanded half life. And that was, and that really helped. Then people started, and that's in all subspecialties, not in hematology and not in heritable reading disorders only, started uh, working on the personalized or individualized therapy. Afterwards, we, uh, we had another leap, and that was the novel agents, especially um, um, in map, which is a recomponent by specific antibody that mimics the action of factor eight by binding with both factor eight, I'm sorry, factor nine and factor 10 to bring them close enough to allow the activation of factor 10 by factor nine, as we saw in the coagulation cascade before. Now, lastly, we come to the gene therapy. So is this the cure? Is this the answer? We really have to wait and see the results of the, uh, not only the clinical trials, but the real life experience. So regarding the treatment of vulnerable Van disease, in very simple terms, it's either non-replacement with the desmopressin or DDAVP. And what does it do? It increases the endogenous bumble band factor product. It can be given subcutaneous, IV, or intranasal. Replacement, whether plasma-derived, as we saw in patients with hemophilia, recomponent, which does not contain factor um, eight, but the plasma-derived, which contain the factor eight, as well as the bumble band factor, Platelet transfusion that is usually in the platelet subtype, which is quite rare in our country or in Egypt, pyroprecipitate plasma opaque OBCs. Now we come to the adjunctive therapy. This is really very important and it plays a role, especially in countries like ours, where we have significant resource constraints, though actually we are overcoming it lately. So it's the antifibrinolytics or tranexamic, especially tranexamic acid for the mucous membrane bleeds, and topically we can use the fibrin glue. Actually, these can act like magic, especially in patients with menorrhagia. We don't have. To, we also have to focus and not to forget the treatment complications and uh, how do we prepare patients for interventions, especially surgeries, minor and major surgeries, and the gynecological problem, the significant menorrhagia issue in patients with bone brain disease. So. In conclusion, persons with hemophilia are best managed in a comprehensive care setting, multidisciplinary in nature, educating patients, family members, and caregivers, as well as the treatment of the disease and its complications. Now, uh, prophylactic therapy is the standard of care for those patients, and it really improved their uh, um, quality of life. Uh, again, we are, we are pausing here and saying, is gene therapy the promise of the last few of the single drug administration? Well, we have to wait and see. How about bumble brain disease? It's the most common inherited bleeding disorder, as we saw before, regarding the prevalence. And this is due largely to the heterogeneity of the bumble brain factor defects. The clinical diagnosis can be difficult to make, as we saw before, because of the widely variable phenotype. Combining the clinical assessments of bleeding history by a bleeding score, which we referred to before, the ISTH, BAT, which is most commonly used, whether in children or in adults, and it's a very good one, and it's, you, you fill it in quite briefly. With an appropriate laboratory investigation, the hematologist can improve the capacity to diagnose von Willebrand disease. So it's both clinical and lab. Molecular can help, especially in the type two uh, patients and differentiating the subtypes of the type 2. Actually, I want to pause here and say something. Beyond delivering new medicines, we are dedicated in our efforts as hematologists and pharmac as, as, as pharmaceutical companies to encourage early diagnosis and propel patients towards optimized personalized care, as we saw before in the slide, which sums up the treatment of hemophilia. Now, COVID-19. As you see here, I intentionally put that with the RBCs. So what's COVID-19? This is coronavirus disease 2019. It's caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, which is a novel enveloped RNA beta coronavirus that was declared as a global pandemic by the WHO on the 11th of March, 2020. There is new evidence, as we all know, 
that COVID-19 is not just a respiratory disease. It's a blood disease. Now, data are emerging that it can result in a coagulopathy, as you see here, with in the severely ill, with bleeding complications in DIC, and there are reports of an increased risk of clinical and subclinical thrombosis on the other end. And if you can see here, this area is much thicker than that one, but both processes lead to each other because actually the thrombosis is taking the upper hand. As we know that one of the characteristics of COVID-19 is that it's highly contagious to the extent that more than 164 countries have been involved in less than three months. Or is everything okay? What's happened to the screen? Screen faltered, but you don't have to do it. I'm not sure if it's okay. Okay. It's here, Doctor. It's here. Okay. Yes. Final. Okay. We all know that the proportion of infants and children diagnosed with COVID-19 is currently small, which may and why is that? Maybe related to the lack of pathogen detection among them. It may be because they have a lower risk of exposure, or that they either have mild symptoms or are asymptomatic, which is not easily identified. And we would, I wouldn't say really that they are not, that they are not less susceptible than adults. Now, a bit of history. So the very first diagnosed family in China had a 10-year-old asymptomatic boy, which was only screened, and that's how they diagnosed him. Afterwards, they diagnosed another 7-year-old who had a cough and fever. Now, China actually conducted the biggest study, um, which included 2,135 pediatric patients less than 18 years. 34.1% were lab confirmed with COVID-19, and uh, about 70% were suspect. <coughs> nearly, actually, nearly 1% of the total um, of the total population of patients reported were children under 10 years of age, and only a report of two deaths, and um, several others all over the world. The screen is not working again. Screen is clear. It's not moving. I'm trying to try to slide more slides. It's not moving. Okay. I'll tell you to sit down. Thank you, Doctor. Cheers, Tim. Okay. Okay. Fine. Fine. Regarding the presenting symptoms in the pediatric age group, the most common, as most of us pediatricians know, is the fever and the cough. Other symptoms would include fatigue, myalgia, nausea, and it's very important to note vomiting and diarrhea, whether in children or in adults. Then 2,135 pediatric patients um, who were reported, all groups of, of ages were susceptible. The median age of all patients was seven years and no statistically significant difference was shown in gender. Among both the confirmed and the suspected cases, um, the moderate represented 38.7, whereas the mild well, was the majority representing 51%. The proportion of severe and critical cases among these pediatric groups was highest in infants less than one year of age. 
the second biggest report included, and it was also Chinese, 171 children with a median age of 6.7. So all almost the same. And fever was the commonest symptom. Now, there is a very important phenomena that's been noted in few UK and US studies known as the pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome, which can be quite severe involving multi-systems with significant mortality, but it's actually in very, very few patients. So this slide, I think it's very important. Everyone is wondering, COVID-19 in the pregnant mother, the newborn, and the breastfeeding. So is the vertical transmission actually we cannot be sure. But one of the biggest studies was conducted in Italy and it included uh, 17 neonates where 7.1% actually we couldn't tell in the 7.1% which comprised only five patients whether vertical transmission is the case or not. However, as you can see this cute Korean boy who is he's going back home with the shield, face shield. So, the transmission of in most studies are documenting that, or nearly all studies are documenting that the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 to neonates is thought to occur primarily through respiratory droplets during the postnatal period, when neonates are exposed to mothers and other healthcare professionals. And this is actually the report by the CDC, and this is one of the very important sites to be trusted. Now, regarding the breastfeeding, this is the WHO advice, and the thing is mothers should breastfeed because as we all know that in, that the um, antibodies in the uh, breast milk uh, is very important for the immunity of the baby, yet to ha they have to have all the precautions that other women have, and in case they are COVID positive, then they would do all the other activities that they're supposed to do, just like any other COVID patient. Now, Actually, this is not our topic, but I, it's just a glimpse regarding the management of COVID-19 in children. The treatment of neonates and children is similar to that of adults. But it, of course, it has its own characteristics and can be different regarding the dosing. But it's important to date, and actually I'm confirming that again, that there are, of course, that there are no specific drugs that can cure COVID-19 or vaccines that, when vaccines are still being studied. However, the purpose of treatment is to improve the patient's symptoms and provide better support. Uh, pregnant women, newborns, and children are considered a high risk. In addition, children have milder symptoms, a faster recovery, and a better prognosis, as we all know. Okay, so we need to pause here. What about the role of anticoagulation in children? Well, there has been a recent report in June that was published in Pediatric Blood Cancer, but actually nothing decisive only in the severe cases and in case these severe uh, cases need to take more and of course that would be guided by the default divers and the fiber engine just like what we do in the adults. Now, just a little pause here regarding COVID-19 in person with Lufo. Lufolics are not at greater risk of infection with SARS-CoV-2. Compared to the general population, they are not likely to develop more severe COVID-19. And this is very important to know and to pass on to patients and their families because they are actually worried, as you will see. Worry and concern and psychological stress are one of the challenges that they are up against. That they are, they are up against it. Patients with hemophilia should follow precautions with respect to their disease management. Hemophilia could impact on the management who need to be admitted to hospital. Okay. Complex management of persons with hemophilia and COVID-19 in the pediatric and adolescent age group. Now, the thing is, we are having, if you remember our first slide, the hemostasis slide. We always said that the balance between bleeding and thrombosis is very important. So, here we are having a patient who has a coagulopathy, a deficiency of factor 8 or factor 9 with liability to bleeding, yet the patient is also liable to thrombosis. So, how can we solve this dilemma? So at one end, the patient is liable to thrombosis because of the underlying path, pathogenesis of COVID-19, uh, of money microthrombi, and also these patients, even the pediatric and the adolescent, can be liable to DVT and pulmonary embolism. Why? Because of their mobility issues, and they either it is um, the, the mobility actually is 
little or they can be wheelchair. Also, catheter, language to catheter thrombosis. But you have to pause here. They are protected by one thing, and that is the low factor eight. Because as we know, the high factor eight is one of the um, things predisposing to thrombosis. Now, these patients are liable being hemophilics, they are liable to bleeding. That bleeding can be spontaneous or iatrogenic. Of course, iatrogenic because of the ability, for example, to, um, um, to move around the hospital or for any other cause when for any other cause when to fight the or to fight the So these patients need a hemostatic agents and need an anticoagulants, and we actually have to balance that. So, what are the challenges that a person of hemophilia are up against? Exposure, just like any other patient. Psychological stress, whether due to the isolation, being dependent on others, and that would minimize the, the isolation and require lots of care when dealing and handling these patients and then treatment. So, treatment has many categories. Most of our patients would receive home, uh, sorry, would receive hospital treatment. Not like abroad, they would have home treatment. So, so the transport issue, which carries a very high risk for infection, and whether they are coming from far places, and of course the resource constraints, especially now. But hopefully we are trying to overcome that. These are important references. And actually, I would like to thank my patients and their family because I always believe I owe them so much. Our hemophilia team, our social worker, our hemophilia nurse, and here was um, some of our fifth grade uh, students. Um, and also, I would like to um, pause here and thank all medical doctors everywhere and healthcare professionals and their families because uh, actually, uh, even today, like I had a message from one of the doctors telling me that. that a few doctors wanted to attend, but unfortunately, because of the isolation and all that, they couldn't. So they are really going through so much, and we hope uh, all this passes to along. Then, another thing, this is the new normal that we have to really think about in the workplace, especially that now we are all, um, uh, we and all people are going back to work. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shukran Yuda, Haditi Dr. Mege, for uh, the fruitful presentation. While the effort done in the presentation, I'm sure you're welcome. And of course, I'm sure you're the most important part of the Thank you so much for, for, you, for your efforts. And it's time for questions. Uh, please feel free to ask uh, Dr. Mege directly if you, if, you, if you like a question or uh, share a question in the chat. In the chat. Yes, I'm not sure. 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 I'm not وكنت عايز اسال بس بالنسبه للفومبل فرانت ديزيز يعني لو احنا عايزين نشخصه بالنسبه لله فلو بالنسبه لل يعني البليدنج تايم يعني هل هو بيعمل ولا لا وبرده البي تي تي والبي تي يعني بالنسبه للثري تايب صح حضرتك عايز تقرر تسيبهم كده تساعد في اللاب ده يعني طيب <تصفيق> Um, of course, this is a very important question and a challenging one that we all come up against whether we are hematologists or non hematologists. So, um, sorry about that. Um, the cabbage line, you know, and I am suspecting. Oh, and Clinical, and I have to suspect from the brand disease based on clinical manifestations, and usually it's mucocutaneous bleeding, family history, as as well as 
in, in um, any other challenging situations that occur to the patient. I do not mind suspecting this patient to have bundle brain disease. You better have to do it again. Have to do it with your dark platelet count, I should take up the case in the dark platelet type. Have to do it Bleeding time, we're bleeding time. It's an easy test. We not very specific and not very sensitive. The doctor got them a diet PTT and in fact, for eight activities. That can be slime. Usually, I only in the can I am down the bone of brain disease or the mammal bone of brain disease. Afterwards, I pity in the anna, I should in time for mammal bone of brain factor antigen activity. We cough. وبعد كده هشوف الريليشن شيو بين الانتيجين ويك اوف عشان اقدر احدد ايه التايب سيكل تايب 2 لان احنا في مصر ما عندناش الماتشنس اللي هم بيساعدوا في الكلاسيفيكيشن بتاع الحاجات. بيتا بيبقى برولونج في كل الانواع ولا ممكن في نوع من الثلاثه بيبقى مش مش برولونج؟ عندك؟ البي تي تي تمام نعم <تصفيق> 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 <تصفيق>
وينبهه انه ممكن يحصل بليل بس الحقيقه انا مش عارفه ليه انا مش ال ال التيشيرتات عندي مش ظاهره ليه انا مش عارفه حضرتك كنت بتضغطي بس عليه يعني هو لا ما انا عارفه هي مشكله من البرزنتيشن اه اوكي انا بس ال اه اه ممكن تكون معلقه يا دكتور حضرتك عمالي ستوب شيرنج يا دكتور ستوب شيرنج ارجع لحضرتك الوضع كما كان عليه تقدر تشيل ساعتها وتشوف الاسئله اه اوكي هو بقى هو بقى فوق اوكي ستوب شير بالظبط بالظبط اوكي ايوه بالظبط كده حضرتك Do you have any other questions or any other topics that you would like you would like us to discuss? With the kids, we'll we'll make arrangements, inshallah. Nee, no, sir. Ah, we're not going to. Oh, of course. If you have something very important, of course, the topic of the thrombosis with COVID-19 is very important. Yeah. We heard the topic of hemophilia care. We, I think, we heard the truth. We heard the things that the people in the moment heard. كل شويه بيظهر فيها حاجات بس مش قوي اللي هو الكوفيد 19 في البيدياتريك ايشو. لان كل شويه مور بيشنتس ار دايجنوست. زي برضه موضوع الانتي كوادلز دوت هذا الاسير يعني. بالظبط. هل في حد من الاودينس لو اكسبيرينس مع بيدياتريك بيشنتس ويز كوفيد 19 ذات وير كانديدتس فور انتي كوادلز او هاد سيجنيفيكت مايكرو ثرومبايت؟ أو manifesting with thrombosis أو significant coagulopathy The patient that that I came up across, يعني يا صبر يا تين إيجز أو أدولسنس. Okay, okay. ما كان ما كانش أطفال. أنا عندنا كان في few suspected cases who had a test and and they were diagnosed and referred to the hospital for isolation. Okay, okay, okay. It's it's very good. I mean, the patients. إن في حد بيسأل ما أعرفش did did we record the lecture؟ ممكن يسأل ده. Is the lecture recorded؟ آه تمام هي هي lecture مش مش recorded مش مسجلة. هي lecture مش مسجلة. أنا أفكر إنه we're recording it. بس we can do another lecture complimentary لنا إن شاء الله يعني نبقى برضه في الريفرنس ونكمل على lecture إن شاء الله. بإذن الله. دكتور ماجي بشكر حضرتك جدا بجد على البرزنتيشن و thank you so much بجد على الانتايتس الجميلة ديت بخصوص الكوفيد 19 يعني حقيقي كلنا استفدنا جدا وحبينا جدا البرزنتيشن ونتمنى إن شاء الله يعني دايما تأكيدة كده حريصة إن شاء الله إنها تكون بارتنر لحضراتكم. لما ينعكس على مصلحه البيشنت بشكل كويس ان شاء الله. ثانك يو سو ماتش لحضرتك جدا. 
وفي نهايه الميتنج انا بشكر كل الناس واشكر كل الدكاتره على انهم شرفونا ثانك يو سو ماتش لوقت حضراتكم واتمنى ان شاء الله ان احنا دايما نشكركم على خير ان شاء الله ثانك يو جدا ليك شكرا جدا 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 شكر